The town of Falk, Arkansas has been the location of many sighting reports of Bigfoot since the early 1950s, with a movie based on the sightings, The Legend of Boggy Creek. It was part fiction, part fact, but there was no doubt about the reality of the creature that peeked through the window at Mrs. Ford on that night in May of 1971 as she lay sleeping on a living room couch in her new house in the Jonesville area of Falk. It had gleaming red eyes and a large clawed hairy hand which had stuck through a hole in the window screen. Mrs. Ford naturally screamed and her 25-year-old husband Bobby and his brother Douglas ran outside to look for the intruder. In the woods near the house, they saw a massively built, six-foot-tall creature covered with hair. Douglas fired at it as it moved away into the trees. They called out Constable Ernest Walraven from Falk, who searched and found some tracks. An hour later, the creature was back, kicking on the door. It was fired at again, whereupon it vanished. In the early hours of May 2nd, Bobby took a walk outside and was grabbed and pulled to the ground, but managed to break away. He was taken to a local hospital and treated for extensive scratches. During the next day, officers from the Sheriff's Department found the large footprints typical of Bigfoot. The apparently aggressive behavior of this Bigfoot was not typical of the Falk monster, and in fact, the locals tended to have an affectionate regard for the beast, which they displayed by wearing t-shirts inscribed with the message, Save the Falk Monster, and organizing a Draw the Monster contest for the school children. Just a month after the Falk sighting, a Bigfoot made a number of appearances at Pinewood Mobile Manor, a trailer court near the Dales, Oregon. June 1, 1971 was a day of bright sunshine and the three owners of the trailer court, Dick Ball, Jim Forkin and Frank Verlander, were having a business meeting at the office there. Looking through the window, they could see a meadow and beyond that a cliff. Moving among the small oak trees and rocks which had over the years fallen from the cliffs above, the men saw a seven and a half to eight foot tall creature, which appeared to be very large and dark gray. It was about 260 yards away. They watched for approximately 20 seconds as it moved hesitantly among the rocks before being eventually lost from sight. On the evening of the following day, Richard Brown, a high school music teacher who lived on the site, was returning home with his wife after choir practice. They saw a large creature standing in a nearby field. Brown fetched a rifle with an eight times telescopic sight from his trailer and for five minutes watched the creature, which was only 50 yards away. He described a 10 foot tall, muscular, hairy creature weighing six to 800 pounds. Brown, who had done a lot of hunting, was sure it was neither an ape nor a bear. As he lined it up in the scope sight, he started to squeeze the trigger, but found he could not shoot it. He said, it seemed more human than animal. This is a drawing Richard Brown made of the creature he saw. This is Richard Brown standing where he stood when he was watching the creature. When Joan Mills and Mary Ryan stopped their Volkswagen on Highway 79, a backwoods road near Louisiana, Missouri, they were looking for a quiet spot to picnic. This was in July 1971. They had set out their lunch and started to eat when they were assailed by a stupefying smell. Miss Ryan said, I never smelled anything so bad in my life. Joan Mills likened it to a whole family of skunks. It was then that she saw the figure that was standing behind them in the bushes and waist-high weeds. Mary described it as half ape and half man. The face was definitely human, like a hairy human. With a gurgling sound, the Bigfoot started to walk towards the two women, who leapt into their car and locked the doors. The creature, still making a noise, came up to the car and rubbed it with its hands, and then tried to open the doors. They could not escape because the car keys had been left outside with the picnic, so they could only sit tight and wait for the Bigfoot to lose interest. When Joan Mills sounded the horn, the Bigfoot leapt backwards and kept at a distance from the car. Then it examined their picnic table and, after smelling a peanut butter sandwich, ate it in one gulp. It picked up Joan's purse, in which was the car keys, took a few steps towards the woods, and then dropped the purse and continued its amble until it was out of sight among the trees. Then Joan sprinted out to pick up her purse and keys, and they made good their escape at high speed. One night in June or July 1971, a farmer, identified in the report only by the initials D.K., 
went into his yard near Sharpsville, Indiana, to see what his dog Zipper was attacking. There he found the dog snapping and snarling at a great hairy creature that had an ape-like body, but a head that was neither ape-like nor human. It looked, he said, more like a furry helmet. The Bigfoot was about nine feet tall and covered in dirty, stringy hair, and it had a rank and sickening odor, something like decaying meat and vegetables. It swung its long arms at the dog in a slow-motion manner, not actually hitting it, and as it did so, it growled in a deep, rumbling voice. Although the dog was lunging with bared teeth, it did not appear to be actually connecting with the creature. So although there was much sound and fury, very little damage was done to either party. DK said that the creature appeared confused and uncertain, as though it was in a situation in which it was unsure how to act. DK ran indoors for his shotgun, and when he came out, the creature had made off towards the creek. Although it was too far away, he fired a couple of shots after it. When he reported the incident to the sheriff, he was laughed at. So, although there were subsequent visitations, he never again notified any authorities. DK told investigators Don Worley and Fritz Clem that the creature came to his house five more times, always during darkness. And although he followed it back to the creek, he was never able to get a clear view of it for a shot. It was cunning, he said, and always positioned itself so that there was an obstruction between it and himself. On one occasion, when he tracked it into the thick woods, it doubled back and was seen by his mother from the house to be trailing DK. During the winter of that year, DK found that a small pond had inexplicably dried up, and beside it was a circular area of grass and weeds between 20 and 40 feet across, which had been swirled and flattened with a counterclockwise motion. This type of nest has been found in various parts of the world, and is usually considered to be connected with UFO landings, as sometimes are dried up ponds. Although UFOs quite often take an interest in ponds and other bodies of water, there is really no positive evidence that they are the cause of either nests or evaporated ponds. But, as a matter of interest, it must be noted in conjunction with the Bigfoot sightings. The creature continued to haunt DK's property. By the spring of 1972, he and his brother were both married and living in the house. One evening, they were out, and when they returned together, they found their wives in a hysterical state. The women said that the Bigfoot had been trying to pry open an aluminum window, Outside was the usual strong Bigfoot smell, but strangely, the damaged window frame showed no marks of claws or damage to the surrounding wood. The Bigfoot returned on two more occasions in the autumn. The first time, DK saw it from the house and left it alone, and on the second visit, he followed, carrying his gun, but he had no more success in apprehending the creature than on earlier occasions. A creature which exhibited some very strange characteristics appeared during August 1972 at Rochdale, Indiana. Early in the month, Randy and Lou Rogers became aware of an unsettling presence that seemed to be centered on their farmhouse outside the town. There was a great amount of banging on the walls and windows, and it seemed to be increasing in intensity each night. When Rogers ran outside, shotgun in hand, he would catch a fleeting glimpse of a heavily built, six-foot-tall Bigfoot loping away into a nearby cornfield. For two or three weeks, regularly between 10 and 11.30 p.m., the Rogers waited for the creature to arrive, and with it came a smell of dead animal or rotting garbage. Alongside her natural fear, Mrs. Rogers had a good deal of curiosity, reasoning that if it had meant to harm them physically, the Bigfoot could have done so before on a number of occasions. She left waste food out for it, which was taken, and sometimes it bobbed about outside, watching her through the kitchen window. Although it stood on two legs, it ran using all fours, and in that position it still reached as high as Mrs. Rogers, five feet nine inches. Even more unnerving was the fact that it left no tracks, even when running through mud. It seemed to have a most tenuous relationship to the physical world, hardly touching the ground as it ran and making no noise as it went through the undergrowth. In fact, sometimes the Rogers thought that they could see through it when they looked at it. The Rogers were not the only people in the community to see the creature, and by the third week of August, some three dozen people had made reports of an interloper wandering about at night. Also, an incident which might have been connected had been noted by a number of locals, including Mrs. Rogers' brothers. 
They had seen a luminous object hovering over the cornfield into which the creature would retreat after visiting the Rogers' home. It had exploded as though an aircraft had blown up, but no debris had been found. This had occurred only an hour or two before Mrs. Rogers' very first sighting of the strange creature. A group of friends made up a posse with Rogers to try and capture it. One young man, who wished to remain anonymous, met the Bigfoot when it stepped out onto the road in front of him. He challenged it, but when it did not stop, he fired at it. This had no apparent effect, and the Bigfoot got away. On August 22nd, Carter Burdine and Bill Jr. Burdine, his uncle, found 60 chickens dead on Carter's farm at Rochdale. The corpses were dismembered but had not been eaten and were strewn for 200 yards from the chicken house to the front yard of the farmhouse. Later that evening, as the men searched the area with a local marshal, something big and heavy rushed across the road six feet from Bill Burdine. It was too fast for him to see what it was, but it was very heavy and it smashed a fence down and left a trail of trampled weeds. Later, in the early hours of the following day, the two Burdeen men were returning again to the farm, having taken Carter's wife to stay in town with relatives. As they drove into the yard, they saw a massive Bigfoot standing in the six-by-eight doorway of the chicken house. It completely filled the entrance, blocking out the lights from inside, and with its head higher than the top edge of the door. This time, the two men were joined by Carter's father, Herman, when they cornered the creature in the hay barn but it broke loose and, followed by a hail of shot, ran off into the darkness. The Burdines found that another 110 chickens of their original 200-strong flock had been destroyed. Once again, they had been pulled apart, drained of blood, but not eaten. The whole matter was investigated by Conservation Officer William Woodall. He said eventually, I never could find any concrete physical evidence. All I ever had to go on were a lot of people's stories of what they saw. I think I couldn't find any tracks because the ground was hard and the vegetation high. The frequency with which Bigfoot was reported seen beside or crossing a road suggested that sooner or later one would be involved in a traffic accident. There are, in fact, a few known cases, and one of them occurred in mid-January 1973. It happened to an unnamed truck driver who was taking a load of logs from Grants Pass, Oregon, to Eureka at about 7.30 in the evening. As he took a curve at 40 to 45 miles per hour, a creature with reddish-brown hair standing on two legs and about six and a half to seven feet tall stepped out into the path of the truck. It did not appear to be aware of the truck, which hit it, causing the creature to hurtle off to the left shoulder of the road. The driver could hear nothing above the noise of his engine and, being well acquainted with the appearance of bears, was sure that it had not been a bear. Five or six miles down the road, he stopped to inspect his vehicle. The front was badly smashed and would require extensive repairs, but there was no trace of hair or blood. He had noted that the creature had had no neck and that the shape of its head was rounded and human-like, not like an ape's head, but that its arms had been very long with hands reaching nearly to the knees. His story received little credence, for when he reported it to his supervisor, he was asked what he had been drinking. Another highway encounter took place in April 1973. Don Stratton was driving 12 miles to the east of Estacada, Oregon at 6 p.m. when an object was thrown from the woods and landed on the road in front of him. Stopping his truck, he got out to examine it. A lump of wood from a rotted stump lay on the road, and 25 feet beyond the roadside fence, he could see a creature with brown hair tipped with silver. It was digging at the bottom of a rotted stump and had eventually thrown out the lump which had landed on the roadway. As it stood up, Stratton could see that it was about five feet tall with broad shoulders and no neck. He could see the muscular bronze skin of the throat and chest, which were hairless, but the rest of the body, arms and legs, were thickly covered with hair. A branch hung in front of its face, only revealing the mouth, which had teeth but no fangs. The lower part of the face was flat, before he had more time for closer observations, the creature stepped sideways into the trees and was lost to view. Do some Bigfoot have an affinity with certain humans and appear to them several times in succession? Some Bigfoot researchers think this may be so, and some cases seem to support this theory. Such a case comprises the series of incidents that happened to four young people in June 1973. Their names and ages were given as Sandra, 13, 
Gail 16, Ricky 17, and Jesse 19. And they had taken some rubbish to a dump off Gravel Pit Road in northwestern Jefferson County, Arkansas. During a heavy thunderstorm, they waited in their car in the dumping area for the weather to clear. They first heard a noise of crunching gravel, followed by a call which sounded like a woman's scream, ending in a growl. Then looking through the rear window, they saw, by the light of the car's rear lights and the lightning flashes, a dark, hairy creature, seven to eight feet tall, with glowing red eyes, possibly caused by the reflection of the car's rear lights, they thought, which had a foul odor like rotting flesh. As it peered in through the rear window, Ricky, the driver, started up and they left the area in a hurry. Within the next three to four hours, they saw this Bigfoot, or an identical creature, three more times. It crossed the road in front of their car. Later, when they were at Ricky's house, some seven miles from the dumping area, they heard a noise by some rabbit cages and saw the hairy giant amble off into the woods. And, finally, it crossed the road behind their car when they were driving down Highway 270. The following day, a search of the dump found an oversized footprint with claws instead of toes. During May and June, a number of reports of hairy creatures seen or strange cries heard were made to Jefferson County authorities by the locals. But, as there was a lack of hard evidence, the authorities dismissed the reports as imagination. During the summer of 1973, there was a concentration of Bigfoot sightings in a number of centers in the USA, and one of these was Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania. Here, the reports were investigated and recorded by the Westmoreland County UFO Study Group, which had originally been set up as a UFO research body and now included Bigfoot research, as the researchers had found that the two phenomena appeared to be interlinked. At a large gathering of UFO researchers in 1974, Stan Gordon, the energetic director of Westmoreland County Unidentified Flying Object Study Group, reported on the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot activity, and one case he spoke of runs as follows. On the evening of September 27, 1973, at about 9.30 p.m., two girls were waiting for a lift in a country area when they saw a white, hairy creature with red eyes standing seven to eight feet tall in the woods. Even more surprising was the fact that it carried a luminous sphere in its hand. Shocked, the girls ran home and told what they had seen to the father of one of them. He went into the woods to search for the creature and was away for more than an hour. The UFO study group investigator knew the girl's father, who confirmed that his daughter had seen the Bigfoot, but he denied that he had gone into the woods and forbade anyone else to go into the woods, stating that some things are better left alone. Several people in the area stated that during the time the man was in the woods, an object that looked like an airplane was seen stationary in the sky above the woods, and that it shone a bright beam of light down into the trees. Since the incident, the man appeared to have experienced a personality change, according to people close to him. Soon afterwards, he acquired a book of prophecies and would often talk about the coming end of the world. The latter part of the story is typical of UFO contactee cases, though the nature of the connection between these UFO-oriented incidents and the Bigfoot sighting remains unclear. Early in October 1973, near Galveston, Indiana, Jeff Martin, or Jim Mays, was fishing one evening. He looked over his shoulder to see an ape-like figure watching him in the dusk from about 20 feet away. He called to it, but it slipped off into the twilight. A short while later, he felt a touch on his shoulder, and behind him stood the creature, a sandy-colored Bigfoot. It ran swiftly away, and Jeff or Jim followed behind. As it crossed the road, he could hear its feet slapping on the hard surface. Then it leapt a ditch and vanished into the trees. Almost instantaneously, a glowing bronze light rose from the woods and shot away into the sky. Two days later, he returned with his fiancée, her father, and two friends. As they drove to the area, they were followed by an aerial light which disappeared before the journey's end. At the place where Jeff or Jim had last seen the creature, it was standing amid tall weeds. One of the party thought that when they turned their beams on it, the beams seemed weaker. Using the surrounding herbage as a guide, they estimated its height as between eight and nine feet, and although two of the party had retreated to the car in fear, the others shouted questions and curses at it. As it failed to respond in any way, they tried throwing rocks, but they could not see whether the missiles bounced off, missed, or went through the creature. 
Whatever their aim, the creature did not move. Because of another car on the track, they had to move their own car, and when they returned, the Bigfoot could no longer be seen. Of possible significance in this case is the fact that Jeff or Jim's fiancé's father had, since 1965, a dozen or so UFO sightings and on one occasion had exchanged flashed signals with a UFO. The final case we described for 1973 has some of the strangest aspects of any in this book and once more seems to link the presence of Bigfoot with mysterious hovering lights. The events started at 9 p.m. on October 25th at a farm near Greensburg in western Pennsylvania, the same area where so much activity had occurred during the year. On that evening, about 15 people at the farm saw a large, bright red ball slowly descending towards a pasture. The 22-year-old farmer's son, who is the chief participant in this case and has been given the pseudonym of Stephen, decided to go on and investigate, and with him went two 10-year-old twin boys. As they drove toward the landing site of the object, Stephen noticed his headlights starting to dim. The three continued on foot to the top of the hill, where they could see the luminous object on or very near the ground. It appeared to be about 100 feet in diameter, dome-shaped like a bubble, bright white, and it illuminated the surrounding area. It was making a sound like a lawnmower, and the three could also hear screaming sounds coming from its vicinity. One of the twins shouted a warning as he saw something moving along the edge of the field on their right. The air smelt of burning rubber, and by the light from the object, they could see two ape-like creatures with green glowing eyes. One was about seven feet tall, and the other over eight feet tall, and they were covered with long, dark gray hair. They seemed to be communicating with each other by making whining, baby-crying sounds. Stephen, who had brought a rifle with him, fired over the heads of the creatures, which were now walking slowly towards the witnesses. As they did not halt, he fired another round over their heads, but they continued walking. One of the twins was thoroughly scared and ran away from the others back to the house. Stephen then fired three rounds directly into the larger creature. As it was hit, it made a whining sound and raised its hand toward the other Bigfoot. At the same time, the glowing bubble disappeared and its sound stopped. The big feet turned slowly and walked back into the woods. Stephen returned with the youngster to the house and called the state police. About 9.45, Stephen and a state trooper returned to the site by patrol car. Where the luminous dome had rested, they could see a glowing white illuminated area that extended to a foot above the ground and was bright enough for a newspaper to be read by it. The horses and cattle in the field did not venture into the glowing area but remained just outside. As the men walked by the woods, they could hear the sound of a heavy body crashing through the undergrowth, but each time they stopped moving, it would stop a split second later. It was then that the trooper returned to the barracks and phoned Stan Gordon. The investigators arrived at around 1.30 a.m. and checked the witness and location for radiation, but found no unusual readings. The glow had now disappeared, and the hard surface retained no markings. As they stood in the field interviewing Stephen, he began to shake violently, breathing heavily and growling like an animal. His father and George Lutz, one of the investigators, had to hold onto his arms to stop him falling. He suddenly flailed his arms, throwing the two to the ground. Stephen's dog then ran at him as though to attack, and when he went for the dog, it ran away crying. He ran around the field, swinging his arms and making animal growls before collapsing on his face into a manured area. Other investigators experienced breathing difficulties and dizzy spells, and a strong sulfur-like smell was present. Soon Stephen regained consciousness and was helped by the others down the hill. He still seemed very confused and yelled phrases like, Keep away from the corner! It's in the corner! He was also mumbling confused predictions about the end of the world and the doom of mankind. The investigation group decided that the situation required skilled psychological counseling and investigation and called upon the services of Dr. Berthold Eric Swartz, whose investigations into the psychological and paraphysical aspects of UFO experiences are widely known in UFO research circles. Early in 1974, dramatic events were reported from Florida. On January 9th, in the early hours of the morning, Richard Lee Smith reported to the police that he had run over a giant black man on Hollywood Boulevard in the Fort Lauderdale area. 
Trooper Johnson was dispatched to the scene and examined Smith's car, the front of which was damaged and had blood stains and coarse dark hair adhering to it. Richard Smith explained that he had been traveling at approximately 50 miles per hour when he overtook a huge man wearing dark clothing. As he came alongside, the man stepped into the path of his car. He swerved, and the figure lurched into the car and rolled beneath the front wheel. Smith stopped and, in a state of shock, watched the man slowly get up, stand to a full height of seven to eight feet, make a roaring sound, and lurched towards him in what he thought was a threatening manner. He jumped into his car and made off. The police began to receive other calls from motorists who had seen the man, and soon there was a full-scale hunt in progress. At 2.12 a.m., patrolman Robert Hollemayall saw the figure coming down the road towards him, and leaving his car, he ordered it to halt. When he turned his light onto it, he was amazed to see a huge figure over seven feet tall with long, swinging arms and covered in dark gray hair. The patrolman drew his revolver and fired two rounds at it. The creature screamed, jumped 20 feet off the road, and ran away at about 20 miles per hour. For the rest of the night, the police combed the area with cars and helicopters, but no further trace of the Bigfoot was found. It had returned to the Everglades swamps from which it had probably originally emerged. Now we return to Pennsylvania, where strange encounters continued to be reported. On the night of February 6, 1974, at Uniontown, a woman identified as Mrs. A by the Bigfoot investigators was sitting in her house watching television. About 10 p.m., she heard a noise coming from her porch. The house was set in an isolated and well-wooded area, and she suspected that some wild dogs, which she had seen in the neighborhood, were nosing about in some tin cans. She picked up her 16-gauge shotgun, intending to scare the animals away. She turned on the outside light and, stepping onto the porch, found a seven-foot, hairy Bigfoot standing six feet from her. It raised both hands above its head, and Mrs. A, assuming it was going to jump at her, reacted instantly by firing at its midriff. There was a brilliant flash of light, like a photographer's flashbulb, and the creature had disappeared, leaving no trace whatsoever. Very shaken, Mrs. A went back inside, and a moment later her telephone began to ring. It was her daughter's husband who, with his wife and children, lived a hundred feet away in a trailer home. He had phoned to ask what had happened, having heard the shot. She told him, and he decided to go over to her, taking with him a revolver. On his way, four or five seven-foot hairy creatures with long arms and glowing red eyes emerged from the woods and came towards him. He fired twice and ran into Mrs. A's house. At this time, both witnesses could see a bright red flashing light that revolved like a police car beacon and looked like a Christmas tree decoration. It was hovering over the woods only 500 feet away. The cumulative effect of these incidents made them decide to phone the state police, who quickly arrived. The police could find no tracks on the frozen ground, but noted that the domestic animals were behaving in a very frightened and untypical manner. Mrs. A's son-in-law had, interestingly, encountered some strange creatures the previous November. On that occasion, he was walking his dog one night when he thought he saw a trespasser on his land and called out, challenging him. The figure came towards him, and he saw it was a tall, hairy Bigfoot with glowing red eyes. Because of the wild dogs in the woods, he always carried a revolver, and he promptly emptied all six rounds into the creature. The Bigfoot disappeared in front of him, he could hear it running, but there was nothing to be seen where the noise came from. He went back to his trailer and then immediately returned to the woods with a rifle. Once more he saw the Bigfoot, and when he shot at it, it screamed like a crying baby. His wife, who heard the sound, said it was like a human that was in very deep pain. Later, in 1974, Mrs. Margie Lee had repeated encounters with a six-foot-tall Bigfoot that might have had a sense of humor. The events began in late July in the Wotova settlement near Nawada, Oklahoma. After a number of sightings over several weeks, the Lees realized that the creature was harmless and they lost their fear of it. It appeared to be a young male covered with one inch long brown hair. It could run very fast, even faster than a deer, but it ran very quietly, making a noise like moccasins over gravel. Its eyes were normal and not luminous as in so many other Bigfoot reports. 
It also seemed to be more interested in women than men, ignoring houses in which only men lived and showing a greater interest in Mrs. Lee than in her husband John. These characteristics led them to think that it was probably seeking a mate. The Lees grew quite fond of their Bigfoot when it started to play a little game with them. Each day they found that it had put a feed pail in front of the barn, blocking the doorway. Every day they took it away and hid it, and every night it sniffed the pail out and replaced it in front of the door. The only time Mrs. Lee heard it make a noise was once when it seemed to laugh. Eventually it became a nuisance, thrashing around in the barn and crashing through the chicken-wired window when chased away. It also helped itself to a neighbor's chicken. It was also often seen by two sheriff's deputies, Gilbert Gilmore and Buck Field, who had been called to deal with the situation. One night they caught it in their car headlights and opened fired. The Bigfoot gave no sign of being wounded, but ran off into the woods. During the following morning, a very exhausted Mrs. Lee, who had missed many nights' sleep owing to the noisy rompings of the Bigfoot, was taking a shower when there was a loud thump on the wall outside. Though she dashed to the window, she was too late to see the Bigfoot leave, having made its final farewell. In December 1974, William Bossack, a 69-year-old dairy farmer of Frederick, Wisconsin, was driving home at 10.30 p.m., when he saw the strangest looking thing I ever saw. Beside the road was a disc-shaped craft, the lower half hidden by a mist. But what really caught Bosak's stunned attention was the creature he saw behind the curved glass window in front. It was illuminated by a bright light, the source of which he could not see, and it looked, in some respects, something like a Bigfoot. It was covered all over by a dark tan fur, except for the face and chin. The nose and mouth were quite flat, but the strangest feature was the ears, which stuck out from the head about three inches on either side, and reminded Bosak of a calf's ears. Its eyes did not look unusual, but were large and protruding, indicating surprise or even fright. In fact, Bosak thought that it was just as scared as I was. It held its arms above its head, and from the waist down, the body was hidden by the mist. Bosak estimated that for ten seconds he studied this apparition, then accelerated quickly past, and as he did so, his car lights dimmed. He also thought he heard a soft whooshing noise. Ruminating on the sighting later, he wondered if he had perhaps seen a spaceman in a padded suit, but decided that, as he could see no seams or buttons, the fur had been part of the body. I sure wish I would see it again, Bosak told investigator Jerome Clark. Now I wouldn't have hesitated to stop. If he had stopped and obtained a detailed description, perhaps we would now have conclusive proof that Big Feet and UFOs are directly linked, at least on some occasions. As we have reported, UFOs and Big Feet have been seen in close proximity, but we have no reliable reports of a Bigfoot emerging from or entering a UFO. In 1975, the Big Feet in Florida, known locally as skunk apes, because of their strong smell and ape-like appearance, were again active. Richard Davis, living in an isolated area of Cape Coral, had for a period of three weeks been disturbed when his Alsatian dog reacted during the night to the presence of an unknown prowler. On February 2nd at 2 a.m., the dog, an aggressive young female, was restless. It seemed there was another visitation from the prowler. Davis turned the dog loose, but she soon ran back to the house and cowered beneath the car inside the garage. The animal was not barking, but her eyes were wide open with terror. Subsequently, her character changed. Davis went out to the yard carrying a revolver and saw a nine-foot-tall Bigfoot with grayish-brown hair and flat features. It was about 15 feet away, and as it took a step towards him, he fired into its chest and saw the bullet hit it. The Bigfoot grunted and ran off. After firing the first shot, it had been Davis's intention to fire the rest of the cylinder at the animal, but to his amazement, he found that he was mentally unable to pull the trigger again. A search outside the house found footprints on the air conditioning unit. This interest by a Bigfoot in an outside air conditioner has also been noticed by some neighbors. Mr. and Mrs. McClowski, who lived about half a mile away, had during the same three-week period been plagued with very foul smells near their home during certain evening hours and had found large fingerprints on their outside air conditioner. Another Bigfoot or skunk ape incident was reported on March 24th 
and is recorded in the files of the Dade County Public Safety Department in Florida. It seems that about midnight on that date, two men, Michael Bennett and Lawrence Groom, were driving on a dirt road towards Black Point. When, nearing Gould's Canal, they saw an eight to nine foot Bigfoot standing by a stationary blue Chevrolet car and rocking it back and forwards with great force. An hysterical man got out and yelled for help. When the Bigfoot saw the witness's car arrive, it ran off into the mangroves. Bennett and Groom must have left the scene very quickly too, for the report states that they did not see where the man ran to. When the police later searched the area, neither the blue car nor the Bigfoot could be found. During September and October 1975, one or more Bigfoot were creating a furor among the populace of Noxie, Oklahoma, a few miles north of Nawada. On September 1st at 8 p.m., farmer Kenneth Tosh heard a scratching sound coming from a derelict house near his own residence. He and a friend saw from a distance of 10 feet a dark brown, hairy creature, 7 to 8 feet tall. The one and a half to two inch long hair covered it completely except for its nose and around the eyes. They saw it again later and fired at it, but with no effect. Other friends also tried to shoot it from close range, but it always ran off, apparently unharmed. Bigfoot investigator Hayden Hughes found 24 people who had seen or heard the Noxie Bigfoot. Another case of multiple sightings occurred on the Lummi Indian Reserve near Bellingham, Washington. The Big Feet were seen more than a hundred times, and the witnesses included the reserve policemen. One of these, Sergeant Ken Cooper, was called out on October 24, 1975, at 2.20 a.m. to investigate a report of a prowler who had ripped a plastic storm door from its hinges. He was with several other people when the spotlight illuminated a seven and a half foot tall, black, hairy creature standing in the backyard. The face was black, leathery, and wrinkled, and the head sat directly on the muscular shoulders, no neck being visible. Two of the upper and two of the lower teeth were longer than the others, and the nose was flattened. Sergeant Cooper walked to within 35 feet of the Bigfoot, which had crouched down and not run away. For many minutes, the two faced each other. The sergeant had a shotgun with him, but was not sure whether the creature was some kind of human, and so was reluctant to shoot. At that time, there were seven other witnesses. A noise to one side caused the man with the spotlight to shine it across the yard, and announced that there was another one over there. Before he retreated, Sergeant Cooper noted that steam appeared to be coming off the Bigfoot's body, as though it had been wet and running. Later, he found large tracks. He also saw the Bigfoot again when it ran alongside his car, which was traveling at 10 miles per hour, and it gave a powerful, high-pitched call. When reading these reports, we wish the police and public would carry cameras rather than guns. This did in fact happen in the following case, but unfortunately, the results were no more useful. The events occurred in November 1975 in Citrus County, Florida, where seven young men were sitting around a campfire when they briefly saw three big feet, the biggest eight feet tall. The men got out their lights to search the area, and 18-year-old John Saul collected his camera with flash unit from his car. He separated from his companions, set his camera for an average range, and crouched down in the grass waiting for something to come into view. The charging circuit of the flash unit made a quiet, high-pitched note when switched on, and Sol later thought that that might have attracted the Bigfoot towards him. He heard a noise behind him and turned slowly. Two feet away stood a Bigfoot observing him. He fired his camera, and as the brilliant flash went off, the Bigfoot leapt away into the darkness spinning Sol off his feet and throwing him a distance of 15 feet. He was not badly hurt and thought that the blow had been accidental, caused by a flailing arm of the fleeing Bigfoot. And what of the photograph? As he had not expected to be so close to a Bigfoot, he had focused his camera at 40 feet. He knew that the picture was unlikely to be of any use, and in fact, the only result was a very large, very overexposed blur. Finally, in 1975, on December 26, two teenage girls were involved in a strange Bigfoot encounter at Vaughn, near Great Falls, Montana. On the afternoon of that day, they noticed that horses in a field near their home were behaving in a strange manner, pawing the ground and rearing. When they went out to investigate, they saw a seven and a half foot Bigfoot, 
twice as wide as a man, standing about 200 yards from the horse. One girl brought a 22 rifle from the house and examined the creature with the aid of the telescopic sight on it. Its face, she said, was dark and awful looking and not like a human's. She fired the gun once into the air to scare the creature away, but it took no notice. So after a short time, she fired again into the air. This time, the Bigfoot fell down and started to pull itself along the ground by its arms. After covering a short distance, it stood up once more. This seemed to be the breaking point for the girls who ran off. As they did so, one of them looked back and saw three or four similar creatures helping the first along towards the cover of some bushes. Their report came to the attention of Captain Keith Wolverton, a deputy sheriff for Cascade County who was aware of the many strange happenings that had been and were still occurring in this area. The girl's genuine fright persuaded him of their truthfulness, and the results of a voluntary polygraph test confirmed that both girls were telling the truth. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you have a story you would like to share here, you can email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com.